Hello uh, and welcome to uh, today's webinar. Good morning, everybody watching uh, and those watching this back later on. Hello. Um, so today we are going to be talking about diversity in tech uh, and specifically around creating a culture that's all in. Um, my name is Mark. I'm one of the co-founders and the COO here at HackerJob. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, I work with a, a lot of our accounts um, on the topic of, of DNI, which I know is something that a lot of companies are, are looking at in the, the technical space at the moment. Um, I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Simon from IBM. Simon, welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, morning, if, everyone. If you wouldn't mind giving a, a quick intro to yourself, Simon. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, delighted to be here talking about DNI and talent acquisition today, three topics close to my heart. I work in our talent and transformation practice at IBM, which is probably one of our best kept secrets. Our day job usually sees us going out, meeting heads of talent, heads of HR, and helping advise on HR or talent transformation strategies. Um, so yeah, pleased to be here. Looking forward to the session. Brilliant stuff. Yeah. So in terms of um, what we're gonna cover today, um, we'll do some quick introductions as we've just done um, from a, a hacker job perspective uh, and an IBM perspective. Um, we're going to be looking at diversity and inclusion within the workplace and specifically around some um, acquisition strategies, but also some talent retention strategies that we probably don't get uh, enough airtime um, in this space. Um, we'll also be looking at activating DNI initiatives um, uh, as well as a, a specific deep dive into neurodiversity. And I mean, Simon, do you want to give a little bit more context on some of the things that you're going to be covering? Yeah, with? sure. So in the UK, we run something called the Think Talent Community, which is it's actually a global community. I'm, I head up the UK piece, uh, which is a bunch of folks in basically HR and talent practitioners. We research hot topics and the piece of research and the benchmarking program that we've done this year uh, was all around diversity and inclusion and how talent acquisition teams are achieving competitive advantage through DNI strategies. So what we're going to share today from the IBM side is some of the output of that research. So how companies create a culture of inclusion and activate DNI initiatives. Uh, we're going to do a little bit on neurodiversity and programs to bring, um, you know, neurodiverse folks into the workplace, which is a topic close to my heart. So I'm excited to share some stuff about that. And we'll kind of finish up with the role of TA and how TA teams, um, you know, might be challenged from diversity targets and how they might overcome those challenges as well. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. And, and we'll also be opening up to Q&A um, from those watching. So um, feel free to get involved at any point. Um, if you've got a specific question on a slide, uh, Simon and I can see a, a feed of the questions. So we can jump in and answer as we go. Um, or we can um, do some questions at the end. I think quite a few of you have already submitted some questions beforehand. Um, so we'll make sure we get to those at the end of this session. So um, Quick intro on Hacker Job for those that don't know um, who we are or, or what we do. Um, we're on a, a mission uh, to become the number one technical recruitment platform in the world. And we want to do this by transitioning the industry to an unbiased hiring approach. So our fundamental belief when you're looking at hiring uh, technical talent is that you should focus on their skills not their education background, their gender, their ethnicity, and, and things like this. And the way we go about actually doing this practically is uh, we've built a community now of more than 100,000 tech professionals um, across the UK and Europe. Um, and they can come onto the system and actually highlight their strengths through our online challenges um, and also uh, analyzing their open source projects, stuff like GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab. Um, and then we use this data in a machine learning algorithm to match them with companies looking to hire. So we believe that a Java developer should be assessed on uh, how well they can write Java codes, not the amount of times they write Java in their CV, uh, which is how recruitment has traditionally been done. Um, and throughout our journey um, of getting to where we are today as, as, a, as a pretty successful technical recruitment platform, um, the unbiased hiring piece has been key throughout that. Um, and we've always... Um, try to think of initiatives and, and strategies that will enable our community to be able to get hired based on their skills. Um, over the last 12 months, the business has uh, grown uh, a tremendous amount. Um, and one of the big benefits, Simon, I know we were discussing this beforehand, um, is we now have a, a bigger, uh, an awesome marketing team that have been able to produce some incredible content for us. Um, and the first white paper we released was all around um, the blueprint to building a diverse workforce. And 
I know some, and you're going to come on and untouch about this later. Um, but, you know, I think we can all agree diversity is fundamentally important from a human perspective. Um, I think most of us um, believe that building a more inclusive culture will, um, will just generally be a better place to work. But I think something that is really important, and we were discussing this previously, is, is actually getting that executive sponsorship and that C-level buy-in. And I think the, the key findings um, from uh, some of the research we've done and some of the reports out there is how much more profitable organizations are when they become more diverse and inclusive. So um, I think we found stats that 120% uh, organizations are 120% more likely to hit their revenue targets if they um, come in uh, and approach from a, a more diverse and inclusive perspective. Um, so uh, some of the findings um, we found from our uh, um, blueprint around diversity um, was around um, a, an attraction strategy that actually worked. So um, throughout the survey, um, we noticed how different types of candidates get assessed in different ways. Yeah. Um, something that I'm really passionate about is education. Um, and I think there's tons that we could be doing in this country from a from an education standpoint to actually find the talent of the future. And I know you're going to talk a little bit about that um, from your um, from one of IBM's initiatives on this topic. Um, but it was really interesting how candidates who have come from a boot camp uh, background. So for those who aren't familiar, a boot camp would be a 12 week uh, sort of coding course. Um, are more likely to be rigorously tested throughout the interview process than a person that's done a computer science degree. Uh, but someone who's done a boot camp course might have actually had much more practical experience, been building actual web applications rather than learning the theory behind computer science. And, and ultimately, they're getting assessed for the same job. So why should some people have to go through different hurdles to, to others? Um, and uh, I think the, the big piece that came out from uh, our piece of research from an attraction perspective is, is just designing the end-to-end -end process to be as fair as possible. So um, something that a lot of companies have tried to varying degrees of success is obviously blind profiles. So not being able to see the gender or their education background at the CV review stage. Um, I think we're trying to enhance that by actually giving them data on performance at that stage um, and enabling them to make decisions based on uh, you know people's actual ability rather than you know they went to Oxbridge so they must be a, a great yeah. software engineer. Um, then the, the other key part of the research is all around um, retaining talent um, and I think Simon this is probably something that you're going to come on to in a lot of depth today um, but I think something that is, is evident is that we can't create a retention strategy that is one size fits all. Um, we've got to find um, a way of keeping employees engaged and happy in the workplace um, by understanding their individual needs and creating an environment and a culture that allows those individual needs to flourish. Um, one of the really interesting uh, pieces of uh, research we found was developers who are aged between 31 and 45 um, are the unhappiest group of developers out of any um, from, a, from an age perspective. Um, and you look at, you know, a lot of the disruptive tech startups and, and the cultures that they try and create. And a lot of it is around, you know, table tennis uh, in the office and, um, you know, that might traditionally suit potentially a younger audience. Um, but actually, you know, a lot of the, the great technical talent isn't the millennial hype that, you know, that everybody talks about and actually, you know, is maybe a slightly older audience. So actually maybe more flexi working is more important to them. Um, and something like that. Yeah, well, I think it's about having like policies, procedures and programs that match to people's personal life as they're going through the workplace as well. Um, sometimes if we just look internally at work and we don't think about bringing your whole self to work and what people might go through at different stages in life, then it's difficult to create a culture that I guess integrates and engages people. And if, uh, what's interesting, if you look at a 31 to 45 age bracket, it's probably a lot of people settling down, having families, having more financial pressures, they're putting kids through school. So then the way to adapt that from an organizational perspective, exactly how you say, like flexible working policies, whether you're looking at returning mums, whether you're looking at your paternity scheme, um, whether you're looking at even like carer programs, if you might have more carer responsibilities with your parents and elder people as you're getting into that age. So it's really interesting. It's, I think it's, for me, it's about mixing the two things, personal and work and yeah. creating the right balance. Yeah, 100%. And actually from a flexi work perspective, it was super interesting that in, that, in our research, we found that men are actually 10% more likely to be offered flexi working than women. 
Um, and you know that you could you could look at that in in so many different ways. Um, but again, it's about understanding the individual and being able to create that organization and that cultural impact um, that is in, that's inclusive for everybody. Um, so they were, you know, some of the key things that we wanted to kind of touch on today, you know, around kind of building that unbiased hiring recruitment process mm -hmm. um, to actually enable people to get hired based on their skills in the first place, but also creating that environment where you don't treat individuals um, as a collective and you actually understand what they need from a, from a personal one-on-one -on -one perspective. Um, so Simon, I think we're going to jump over to you and some of the, the research that IBM's recently published on this. Let's do it. Nice. Well, that was, I think that was really interesting hearing some of the research you guys have done and there's a lot of um, similarities in the two. So hopefully this will build from that. Um, we, I was delighted when we decided to do a research on these two topics, these three topics, because they're, they're big ones for me. I think diversity to me is about difference and embracing that we're all different. I've always personally been really interested in meeting new people from different backgrounds and also traveling, seeing different parts of the world and different cultures, right? Um, so for me, that kind of excites me and gets the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. I think inclusion um, for me is about everyone, if we look at the workplace firstly, being able to bring their whole self to work and to actually feel not just that they can be their whole self, but valued and listened to in the workplace. Um, I think certainly in, you know, certain, well, in many organizations, we can have a workplace culture that some people feel stressed and under pressure in. And normally where we pick our friends and, you know, we have our family and our friends in, in a personal life, we have like, we choose like the kind of culture of that environment. And I think in the workplace, if we can look at, I guess, creating cultures that are similar to outside of the workplace and, and teams that kind of appreciate each other and work together and have ways of working that facilitates that and that's really good um, and talent acquisition like I guess I, mean, I grew up as a recruiter I love TA I think it's an exciting time to be in talent acquisition we're moving as a function from historically being an order taker um, to now being a strategic advisor to the business and I guess that's being uh, demanded as business models are being disrupted all industries are changing um, you know looking at digital transformation that organizations are going through whether it's banking where we look at retail and what's happening to the high street um, you know so that means that I think TA need to respond in a, in a way differently to how they did before and, and really you know play that advisory role so it's exciting time to be in TA 100%. so anyway that, that wasn't the research but that was a little bit of my <laughs> views on that we'll, we'll now crack on with the guys with what I guess you you guys have um, tuned in to listen to so we'll talk a little bit about creating a culture of inclusion and I think Mark you're going to chip in and ask some yeah. questions get a bit of dialogue going so it's not just me boring you guys for the next 20 minutes um, we'll talk a little bit about how companies activate those DNI initiatives neurodiversity and then the role of TA um, so as I say just to recap this this isn't IBM's point of view we interviewed 36 companies who are part of this think talent community that we run um, and we've basically spent an hour with uh, HR leaders, talent acquisition leaders, DNI leaders, and execs from those companies uh, to understand really around how they're going about all these topics. And this is the kind of consolidated, aggregated data that came through that and the output. So the first thing we wanted to know is the shape of the organisation, how uh, companies are investing in DNI um, to create a culture of inclusion. So we can see here that I think four and five companies had a specific DNI role. Um, I was a bit surprised that that wasn't higher. Yeah, like yeah. You, you'd expect, I guess, although DNI has been in the, you know, been been a thing forever and a day. I guess it's got it's an emerging trend. It's become more fashionable over the last three or four years. Um, so I think we, we expect that to be bigger. And then only about half a company is having a dedicated DNI team. And what what scale were these organisations? Were these typically larger enterprises or? I, it, it was it was a real mix. So okay. first, it was cross sector. Okay. So we weren't just we're, it's not just looking at tech companies. It's yeah. looking at companies from all different industries. Um, I would say most most were medium to large okay. or corporate organisations, as okay. opposed to smaller businesses or startups, um, because this is kind of we go out to our client base and yeah. this is part of our give back to that community to research and provide them with thought leadership on it so it's mostly larger organizations makes sense, makes sense. okay um which again you would think then the investment you know yeah. but, it, but it shows i guess we, one of the pieces and I, we can share the whole um paper for this afterwards with, with your Absolutely. with your viewers if you want one of the things we co-created was a dni maturity model so we did okay. a workshop and we did like a kind of co-creation lab um and it helps organizations plot their maturity 
on, with, with, with regards to DNI. And I think a lot of organisations have done a lot of good stuff, but are challenged with things like budget, exec sponsorship, how to measure like the outcomes of DNI strategy and how that's really giving business value. So we'll talk to some of these things, but I think, um, but yeah. So and, and as you can see here, only sixty nine percent of organisations are measuring DNI. And if you're not measuring DNI, how can you build a business case? To your point earlier to get the C-suite to really invest more budget, more resource and more impetus in DNI strategies. And, and you can't improve something that you don't measure, yep. right? You know, yep. it's, it's impossible to know, are we actually making progress with this if we're not measuring it in the first place? And that, that number doesn't surprise me, but it's surprising. Yep. You know, I think people do really struggle to actually measure this. And when we're out speaking to companies, often it's like, yeah, we want to do loads. Well, what, what's your starting point? Do you, do you even know where you are at the top of the funnel from a, an attraction piece right now? Do you attract 50-50 between men and women? Or is it, you know, an interview unconscious bias issue that you, you have and actually you favor men throughout the process or, you know, different types of people? So it doesn't surprise me, but I think there's got to be a better way to measure this stuff all orgs. Yeah, and I think in, in, to, in today's world and, you know, as we move into tomorrow, like, I don't think there's any excuse not to measure this. Historically, the, bar the key barrier has been the lack of, like, tech infrastructure the lack of a platform-based model to really integrate all of your data. So if we look at like the, the whole recruitment funnel, yeah. going from source of hire to then productivity of people in the workplace and then retention and then client satisfaction, it, because all of those have been stored in disparate systems, you know, maybe a tech platform, maybe a you know, recruitment technology platform, then an ATS, then a CRM, then an HRIS, yeah. it's, impos it's been impossible, nigh on impossible for organizations to integrate that data and provide analytics from it. Um, but what we have today, certainly at IBM, what we're using, we've built a platform-based model. We're talking to our clients about that as well now. We're starting to roll that out into the marketplace. And we use Watson, like our you know, AI products, um, to analyze the data we're gathering. And we also build virtual machines and automation where we don't have API integrations to take data from point to point. So, nice. uh, you know, I, it, it, I don't know. I know we're not talking about tech today, <laughs> but I think if we can embrace using tech today and tomorrow to really drive this agenda and many other things in the workplace. Um, so yeah, we, you'll have to keep us honest to time as well. If we're <laughs> chatting about this, we might run out of time. Might be a two hour it's, webinar, apologies guys. No, no, well, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so but we then, we wanted to look at how TA are involved. Almost all talent acquisition functions had an interlock with the DNI function, strategy, you know, sponsors. Um, but only, as we can see, three and five TA functions actually had accountability. And that's things like, you know, if TA aren't making the selection decision, because the hiring community are, how can they be custodians of a fair recruitment process? They, you know, they, they might be set a diversity target, i.e. like every shortlist, we want X percentage from a, you know, from a certain, you know, of, of BAME or of yep. women, or, you know, we want to make these accommodations for people with different types of, you know, different abilities. Um, but without true, and this is one of the things that I'll kind of wrap up with, who, who is responsible for this agenda, you know? Um, and I, I personally would love to see TA being given the responsibility to take on more accountability because then they can drive this change agenda. Sure. So we then really looked at strategy and budget. So only 61% of organizations have a DNI budget. That's the starting place. So I think that the, the, the other, you know, the other, what would it be? 49%? No, 39%. Yeah, my maths was not strong. 39%. Um, I think they were still investing in DNI stuff, but it wasn't like a pre preordained annual budget where they're like, right, this is what we're doing. This is the strategy. So it's more like, right, we want to, we want to do some piece of work, get an exec sponsor, get a bit of budget from somewhere or, you know, so um, we want to see that hundred percent. That was interesting. And then we asked how organizations are creating, creating different strategies. Um, I mean, I won't read out all of these. You can see some of the things on the chart here, but the, the main thing, and this links back into what we're saying, was um, the strategies around creating a culture of inclusion. And the, the next slide was, will show you one of the biggest things on that. It was around business resource groups or some organizations called them employee resource groups and different networks. So I'll talk a little bit about that on the, on the next slide. That's one way of creating a culture of inclusion. Um, and there, was, there was a lot of stuff on, on training and helping remove unconscious bias. Um, helping uh, people have better awareness of you know differences and in the workplace um, so, so that so that cropped up quite a lot 
And one of the interesting things, I can't see it behind the QA, <laughs> but performance management, some of you guys might see, was one of the kind of, you know, lesser, maybe I think it was like 5% or something like that. Um, but several organizations, IBM, and one of these, are, were bu are building in expectations around being champions for inclusion and actually building that into like some annual performance criteria. Um, we have something called the Be Equal badge, okay. which is a, it's a digital badge. It's basically a training scheme, which is about it's about it's about four or five hours. It's a mixture of digital video content, then backed up by application of that learning to actually gain better awareness of equality in the workplace. So we had we we basically filmed different people from different backgrounds with different types of abilities and their experiences of difficulties and how they overcame those difficulties in the recruitment process in the workplace so you see people from you know different ethnicities different genders you know from having with different sexual orientations um, with different you know abilities you know people you know maybe who are neurodiverse as opposed to um you know typically diverse so all, all of these sorts of all of these sorts of things um and we then encourage everyone to join a couple of the business resource groups and make a pledge like on our kind of community platform as to what their pledge was around how they were going to push the needle on vni yeah. um so and other other organizations had similar similar yeah. learning schemes yeah no for sure and i think that um tying it into performance reviews is something that when we're speaking to especially larger organizations, they seem to be doing more and more at quite a senior level as well. Mm. Um, it's brilliant to see that you guys have actually got a, you know, an L&D scheme around that to, to build that knowledge, right? Because mm. knowledge is power. And if actually empower, you know, your senior execs and your managers to build that culture, um, then I think we're going to touch on it later. But it's that, you know, top and bottom approach when it comes to d and and inclusion. It is. And like, you know, training's not the answer, but, you know, opening your eyes and having better awareness is part of the solution um i was I, I mean i'm i'm passionate about all of this and i was taken aback probably about 30 to 40 percent of like these videos that i was watching and like consuming and like making me think i was like i never would have thought how that person worked. we're all you know we're all a you know result of you know what we've what we've been through and we yeah. all have our own biases whether we like it or not you can never remove bias because that's part of like our you know yeah. genetics and our you know our, our nurture um so yeah in, interesting stuff um, so employee resource groups, this, this was one of the key, key sort of uh, strategies of how to create a culture of inclusion. Um, for anyone that doesn't know what I'm, I assume most people tuning in in their companies that have some sort of ERGs, um, it's really a networking group that isn't, that isn't exclusive to a certain, so, so if you've got like an LGBTQ plus or whatever community, you, you know, it, it's not just that, you can join as an ally and it's about, again, it's like there's a learning agenda, there's a socializing and a networking agenda, and then there's a kind of business case agenda, like pushing those people back into the organization to work on projects, to kind of like co-create ideas and to champion change. Um, we've got, I, th I think about like, I don't know, 14, 15 at IBM. Wow. Um, and that's just in the UK market. They change from market to market. But as you can see here, four out of five um, organizations that we spoke to have ERGs and, you know, a good, a good percentage had over five. Um, I think why this is important to link it to like talent acquisition and talent attraction is f for me, there's two ways to attract diverse talent. The, you know, one is through like, offline events um, and this is one of the ways that you can do that through building bringing other people into these employee resource groups doing external events yeah. um, gaining awareness of that um, and the other one is through I guess digital recruitment marketing um, we have uh, a D&I a &I website that's kind of linked it's not part of our career site but it's linked to it and we really we really we, we basically market our cult, our authentic culture things that we're actually doing via that to generate you know interest in the external talent you know marketplace and drive that that way i'll show i'll show you guys a video in a minute that's an example of that so i think starting with having you know with the hr function putting policies and procedures in place with having exec sponsorship to do things like ergs and having training programs and then marketing that that's how we're going to in, improve our diversity targets um and and that marketing piece is key right because if you know, I'm a, a candidate and I come to IBM's, uh, you know, career page or whatever. And then I get redirected to this DNI page. It's like, I can see people like me. Therefore, you know, I can resonate with people like me. Yeah. And that's why it's so powerful to be actually 
be able to show champions in a business, right? And be like, you know, this is Susie. This is all the work that Susie's done in one of these ERGs. And this is, you know, the initiatives she's ran and the socials we've had and, and the community that we've built off the back of it. Yeah. Right. And then you do meetups and you have hackathons that are linked to those communities, whether it's women or tech or whether it's people with disabilities. And you're basically bringing, you, you know, it's kind of, if you look at the function of a CRM or a TRM, building like talent pipelines and talent communities, it's really turning that into you know real life events and, and doing that and, and, and doing the you know building the top of the funnel and your like brand awareness via that yeah. um so i guess on that point that's probably a good time to have a look at this is just an example of i mean at ibm by no means we've got everything right there's lots of stuff that you know we were challenged by but this is an example of one of our like dni videos that we have lots on our dni website um that we use to try and you know show people what it's how dni is at the heart of you know our culture at ibm we are standing together, shoulder to shoulder, all working for one common good. And the good of each of us as individuals affects the greater good of the company. These words from our founder, Thomas J. Watson Sr., reflect IBM's past and our corporate character today. In 1899, we hired Richard McGregor, an African-American, 65 years before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. In 1914, we hired our first disabled employee, 76 years before the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. In the 1930s, IBM continued its progressive workplace programs and policies with the arrival of professional women and equal pay for equal work and promoted its first female vice president, Ruth Leach Amanet, in 1943. Women's careers at IBM have been on the rise ever since. In 1953, Thomas J. Watson Jr. established a policy of hiring people without regard to race, color, or creed, making IBM the first U.S. corporation to issue such a mandate. In the years that followed, this non-discrimination policy was expanded to include religion, sex, gender, gender identity or expression, sexual orientation, national origin, genetics, disability, and age. And in 2005, IBM became the first major corporation in the world to include genetics privacy in its non-discrimination policy. We push forward every day, advocating for our employees to provide stability, reassurance, and support. Just as we publicly advocated against the bathroom bills in the United States, so too have we set internal policies to extend same-sex partner benefits in 50 countries. For more than 100 years, from our founders to Jenny Rometty today, we believe that no one should face discrimination for being who they are. We are privileged to work for a company that's had the opportunity to have an impact on history in so many ways. IBMers speak with a diverse voice, representing more than 170 countries, encouraging all of us to think. I mean, what a brilliant showcase of some of the work you guys are doing. Yeah, it makes you feel proud, I think, as an IBM when you watch that. Um, but I think, I think the important thing to temper with that is a lot of people might look, look at it and go, oh, well, you're the big blue, right? It's easy for you to do Just all of these things. Just about to say this, right? But, you know, the, the point that I always make to people <laughs> is that however small you are, however limited your budget is, you know, whether you're like, you know, a startup organization, you can create a culture of inclusion in your own way you know, with no money doing things and then market it. So like that is kind of like a bit spangly and oh wow, look at <laughs> IBM. And as I said, like, you know, I'll caveat that we're not perfect. You know, yeah. we make mistakes like every organization, but anyone can do that. So. No, it's awesome. It's awesome to see. Yeah, cool. Cheers, Mark. Um, so I wanted to share, I think if, if, if we um, pass out the paper after this, um, there's a load of case studies from the different organizations that took part in the research, but obviously didn't want to make necessarily share their research on their behalf. So I thought I'd talk about our inclusion strategy. So our um, DNI leader in the UK, Deborah Richards, um, she's awesome. She and her and the team you know, around her and the business and the exec sponsors basically have something called our pre-hire to retire inclusion strategy. Mm -hmm. And this is what we were touching on, you know, linking to your research. For us, um, it's really about creating a culture of inclusion and making a change really starts at primary education and it goes all the way through to, you know, retirement, like offboarding and even like what folks do after their employment. Um, it's not about generations in the workplace and kind of, you know, assumed trends on what those generations want. It's actually about people going through different periods of life and at every 
point in every juncture in those kind of like life change, life change and life experiences having, you know, a support, fun, a support mechanism for it. So as I won't talk through all of this. You guys can see some of the different kind of initiatives that we've done, but pre-hire really starts at primary school. So we took, um, we, we, it's a combination of our alumni, so like graduates and folks that work for IBM to go back to their schools to help with whether it's check training teachers and technology, whether it's giving speeches to primary school kids around, you know, topics around diversity and inclusion, um, or whether it's sponsoring events like Student Pride or Women in Tech. So there's, there's kind of like an investment. And again, that's not big money. A lot of that is give back from ourselves. So yeah. there might be an opportunity cost of the times time we're not in the office working but again that's accepted and supported well and it's brilliant um again awareness for for ibm staff right that they can actually go in and get involved in some of these initiatives and actually again absorb the real life uh dni and live it right rather than just go on a training module tick the box you know uh, yeah the mind inclusiveness training i'm you know i'm there actually to be you know at student pride with, with some students would be an unbelievable experience for individuals yeah. all going back to the school you know, like advocating to, you know, put, putting yourself, you know, 20 years, 30, 40 years ago in that thing. I yeah. think that that's part of the engage and, engagement and retention. Yeah. You're not just giving back to, you know, making a small dent in, you know, like societal change. You're, you know, actually, it feels good when you do that. Yeah, and sure. so, you know, uh, it's, it's cool stuff. And then young professionals, there's a load of schemes around our, you know, our early professional hiring. So whether that's apprenticeship schemes, which we have some awesome ones, um, or graduates, uh, or anything in the EPH space. And you can see some of the things that we have there. We, we, we built soon to be blue, blue as a platform that basically is, you know, even before you join, you know, and you start your career, you can meet different IBMers, meet your team. You can, you know, look at video content like that. You can, you know, understand what it's about to be in the workplace and you can see what different ERGs you can join and how you might be able to get to them. So it's kind of from your pre-boarding, then right through onboarding, getting involved in inclusion strategies and then a range of mentoring and like mental health and like, you know, assimilation type programs. And then you go into like the mid-careers place. So this is the 31 to 45 bit, I think. I, th I think, you know, Deborah and the team recognize that um, a lot of people as they sort of move into that mid career space, maybe um, they, you know, they have changing circumstances, whether it's caring responsibilities or, you know, family and children responsibilities. So there's a load of policies and procedures that we have around that. Um, one of the cool things and a bit more unusual is the carer's passport. So, what is, yeah, I was, was going to say, yeah. what is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah like a free holiday for carers, <laughs> that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Like, and it's not exactly that. Um, it's, no, it's basically, it's really simple. It's a document whereby if you move from project to project, so you're working in like our consulting business, you can basically, whoever your PM is, it's like a way to say, these are my caring responsibilities and they're adhered to and accepted. Um, so it's just nice. like a simple document and process for saying, you know. It stops that awkwardness of, okay, I've got a new project, a new PM. Yeah. How do I broach the topic that, you know, maybe I have this responsibility that I need to do at some point or, or whatever? Yeah. Really nice. And that links in, we'll talk in a minute about neurodiversity and people maybe, you know, with a autism spectrum condition like Asperger's or autism or even like ADHD or something else like, you know, they, certain accommodations. I've spoken to folks in IBM, some awesome guys there that have been really successful in one project and not successful in another project. And that's because lack of project manager awareness and accommodations in the place. So you, I think, you know, for people with different abilities and different ways of thinking, then there needs to be similar passports or whatever you want to call it as they move through their career in an organization and from project to project. Yeah. Um, so that they're engaged, happy and able to be as productive as possible. Yeah. And that's when it hits your top and bottom line and, you know, it makes a business case out of it. Um, and then towards retirement. So, uh, Again, you can see that it's different. It's, it's accepting that as you move towards the end of your career, you might want to have slightly different roles. You might not want to be full time, you might want to be part time, you might want to become a contractor, a contingent worker, you might want to move into like a non exec role. Um, so it's, it's, it's having different you know, types of employment status to, to, to support that um, and to retain the talent in the business, you know, because obviously the lifespan of people is increasing and there's <laughs> loads of data around that. So, you know, if you're, if you're anywhere from, you know, who, you know, can't put numbers on it but say you know mid 50s through to like mid 70s you might want a different type of work-life balance and you know employment status so there's that and then there's also encouraging those folks to get involved in different like give back programs to develop the next generation and you know new talent and then coaching and mentoring and stuff around that so that's yeah that i mean and, and you can see like all of these things this is where there's not there's not cost associated to many of these any company of any size can start doing things like this and it's you know it's you know it just it you know it starts pushing the needle a little bit um, and then 
similarly to you, Mark, like for me, a lot of us who are involved in this is because we believe it's the right thing to do <laughs> and we care about it and like we, you know, it's just part of our makeup, right? But that there, there, there is a fun, you know, most organizations, especially private sector, are there to make money and to be successful. That's that's the reality of the workplace. So we need to be able to, you know, make business cases to get sponsorship and to get budget. And this is this isn't isn't IBM research. This was actually Burson by Deloitte. Um, so Josh Burson. Um, and you can see here, like you know, two times more likely to meet or exceed financial targets. Much more innovation in the workplace. Response to change. I mean, how critical is that? Six times more likely to respond to change. And we all talk about like agile ways of working today and like you know, transformation and change being the new norm. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I think, um, I think it was the economist or the financial times, uh, last week did a really bold, um, front page cover, basically saying that capitalism, uh, has gone too far <laughs> and that, uh, actually, yes, you know, private orgs do exist to make a profit, but it needs to be purposeful profits. Right. And I think there's, as you said, right. DNI has become a bit of a trend of late and, you know, it's definitely getting more airtime, which is only a good thing, yeah. you know, only positive. Um, but when you can get numbers like this in front of the C-suite, in front of the executives and say, actually, you know, not only is this the right thing to do, but actually we can have a, a bigger impact on the world, right? We can be more successful whilst doing that. So it's a win-win. Um, oh. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's, yeah. it's one of the most common questions we get asked. We, we work a lot with sort of TAs, um, internal recruitment teams, et cetera. And they always ask, how do we get that executive sponsor? How can we do it? Yeah. You know, it sounds like a IBM, very fortunate in the sense that it's built within the fabric of IBM and it's probably always been that. But I'm sure there's still tons of work you guys do to really, well, you know, get that um, we're building, alive. We're building tools and we're trying to measure. And this is, we're, we're on a journey. So one of the tools that we've got is called an adverse impact analysis. Okay. And it basically, again, it uses algorithms to, to review data to say, to use the four fifths rule to look at gender, ethnicity, and other, you know, other measures like that around project teams, around hiring teams. So there's actually a data set there to look at what we're doing to then actually say, well, what, this is where change needs to happen. Um, we've got a tool called CogniPay, which is used by any people manager. They have, they, they take, it takes several different data points. So it's basically for app performance review, it helps, it helps the manager make an unbiased decision around who to promote and who to give a pay rise. So as, a part, as opposed to, I'm on, oh, I like that person, we go down the pub on a Friday, I'll give them a promotion. It basically looks at the criticality of their role to the business. So how important is that to IBM? It looks at external data like talent availability and like potential cost of replacement um, and, and other similar data points wow. like that. Obviously it takes in their performance criteria, their project performance and so on. And it puts all of that into and basically says, well, out of your, if I've got 10 people, these three should be promoted, promoted and pay rise. These, you know, these four should be given a small pay rise. These two should be, um, stay where they are and even these people don't have the skills the business needs so as opposed to losing them out of the organization link them into our training program around reskilling them because we all have like you know diane gearson and Ginny rometti our chro and ceo talk about 120 million new jobs being brought into the workplace in the next few years from ai so it's retention is actually about being open with your workforce to say you know you know we, we've, we value you but we might not need the skills you've got in one to two years time so invest and, and it's, it's something that's going to come up more and more. And I don't, I'm conscious we want to get through the deck. So uh, we might need to uh, skip on. I'll make this point very quickly. But, but <laughs> life, long, lifelong learning is going to become key. Yeah. And that point there where you've got a, a large workforce already, how can you take the people that are doing jobs that might get displaced by innovation or for whatever reason aren't needed anymore and get them through that training program and, and reskill them to be capable in, in new areas? I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, but... I think let's jump. On yeah, cool. But some time. examples of tools. A lot of people say, oh, well, how do you measure that then? That's really tough. So I think it's important. Yeah, for sure. Um, we'll rattle through these and then we'll move on to the neurodiversity overview. But like we, we, we wanted to know how organizations are activating DNI initiatives. A lot of, a lot of this was around removing bias um, through education. We talked about the B equal badges and IBM example. Lots of companies we spoke to had similar, well, you see 89% had similar types of programs. Um, through diverse selection panels. I'm surprised that that's only 42%. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. but you know, like, I mean, how <laughs> how many big organisations have a top down, you know, mandate that every single interview process in every single market, every geography has yeah, to be yeah, diverse? Yeah, 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 it might be sure. pockets, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah. but yeah, it is surprising. That should be hundred percent, right? Like, sure. no brainer. Um, and then ensure like ensuring fair processes was around. There was a bit around accessibility. 
Um, but it was mostly around process transformation. So it was really looking at for how, how do you design the recruitment process? And I think you touched on this to be not just engaging, but fair for everyone. Um, and how do you take like accountability and decision making within that? So these were some of the key things. Um, there's a link to EVP as well, but we'll, you know, we won't really talk about that. Um, and then measures and barriers. So only only half the organisations had DNI targets in place. That's very um, surprising as well. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I mean, I mean, this shows like we all talk about DNI, and I think everyone's doing good, some good stuff in pockets. But if we look at like an integrated oh. DNI strategy end to end, no one really has that. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, or, or very few people have that. I'm sure there's some, com you know, there's an upper quartile if you look at like a you know a quadrant of companies that are doing that, but yeah. not many, you know. Um, and this is what they're measuring gender, ethnicity, early talent, disability, you know, there was other measures, but these were the key ones. And I think disability is really low there. And this is why I want to go on to talk about neurodiversity, which is obviously just, you know, you know, a subcategory of people with different abilities and different ways of thinking. Um, it, it often gets lumped under DNI, and I think it should be maybe separated from the DNI conversation and looked at slightly differently. So we'll talk about that. And these were some of the these were some of the barriers. So like seventy eight percent of people said there's barriers. You know, like skill shortages. How are we supposed to get like a really diverse talent slate with STEM skill shortages in certain markets? Um, lack of leadership support. Time to fill pressure. Like you know, all all of these sorts of things. Um, so that was the first part. We'll talk. We'll talk a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about neurodiversity. And I, I think I'll, I'll kick this off with. In the UK market, so there's, so there's an awesome charity called Ambitious About Autism, um, and they have three different types of ed, you know ed schools and you know education places, um, and they are trying. I think their mission, I can't speak on their behalf, is about employability, getting people with an autism spectrum condition um, into work and into full time work. There's not just that's the right thing to do, but on a societal level, eight, I think I think it's I think it's 84 percent of of people with an ASC who are educated aren't in full-time employment. And a lot of these people, as we'll see when we look at a video in a minute, they, they're, they're highly qualified tech talent, you know, with a bachelor's, some with PhDs, you know, with great, you know, numerical science, math skills, and, and, they're, and they're not in the workplace. And you look at the, the slide previously, and 33% of all said it's around talent shortage is why we can't, you know, one of the barriers to DNI. Well, you know, you've got a, a, a very skillful talent pool that's completely underutilized. Yeah. So I, I would, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm deliberately marketing in Employ Autism, which is basically a scheme of, as part of Ambitious About Autism that um, help do intern programs about getting people that come through their come through their education systems into the workplace. There's some great stories there. We had a case study in the research that you can read, which was M6. It's part of Group M, the WP, WPP, yeah. the media organization. Um, and they did this with, 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 uh, with Employ Autism. There's, they're doing a lot of stuff with Santander. There's, it's, it's, uh, you know, I can make introductions. If anyone wants to reach out to me, I can make introductions. But instead of talking on their behalf today, what I'm going to talk about now is the, the same program, a similar program that we did internally, which was called Ignite. And I'm going to play you a quick video for a couple of minutes around when we, when we piloted this um, in Lansing in the US in 2017. was kind of a bit naive to how I was different from everyone else. I didn't really quite have a concept of it. One day I was taken into special ed and I was given this book about what is this autism thing and what does it mean? It's like, okay, I guess that's a thing now. I only really realized what it meant later. around the time that I was seven that I knew that there was something I don't want to say wrong but that there was something different I used to hardly talk I had to learn how to do anything on my own that I didn't really do it seemed as if there was an instruction manual that everyone else kind of had for communicating and reading other people that I did not have I don't know how I would be handling this like uh, a year and a half ago when I wasn't working. All those skills I kind of uh, compiled into me being able to sit here and look, and look you in the eye.
uh, close to 80 percent of uh, folks in the artisan spectrum are underemployed and many of them have master's degrees and some of them have even done phds and all of them are so passionate uh, however they have not found any jobs Neural diversity in the workplace for me is that we give everybody an opportunity. The IBM Ignite ASD program is where we have developed a pilot program where we have brought candidates that are on the autism spectrum. We see if we can place them within IBM in different capacities. So if I, if I just add to that really quickly. So, um, Basically, we, we, we work with an organization to you know, find talent and then we, instead of like bringing them through the normal interview and recruitment process, we brought them into IBM for a couple of days to simulate them into the workplace. Um, let them walk around and see different project teams, do like some sort of like mock interviewing, um, which really helped them understand you know, the process and feel at ease with that. So that was, it was, it was, a, you know, it was a simple change like that. And then making right accommodations for like the working environment. So you know, maybe not, not, not having to commute into work during rush hour or things like that. So simple things. And then we've rolled that program out in, I think, five different markets now. So, um, and ambitious about autism to do something similar. It's very cool. No, it's, it's awesome. And, and, and it's a topic that doesn't get enough airtime. Um, and it's great to see uh, you guys pushing it. Um, I'm conscious we've got 15 minutes left, so we're going to finish off Simon's presentation. Um, I've seen a few people um, post chat messages instead of Q&As. Uh, we can't see them and uh, I don't want to turn off this feed. So please use the Q&A feature if you want to ask any questions. Um, and Simon and I will make sure we, we've got some time at the end to, to answer them. Do you want to wrap up? Should, I sh should we talk through the TA slide? Yeah, the very last one, just because it might be, I mean, if we've got loads of folks who are in the TA space. So, I mean, th this was like kind of, we wanted to bring all of this research back to like what can talent acquisition leaders do? And these are the five buckets that we, um, which we had. And I thought we'd discuss them, but it's a nice summary slide. So yeah. enablement free sponsorship, that's really about having exec sponsorship and creating a business case. Yeah. Um, talent acquisition as custodians of fairness. Like I think if we, if we look at everyone in the TA team, like championing, making sure they're trying to remove bias as soon as they have and having more accountability and ownership for the recruitment process um, and being outspoken, being advocates when they're speaking to hiring communities. We, TA, we touch a lot of stakeholders, right? Absolutely. So if we put d &I on the agenda in every single conversation, I used to work in the oil and gas industry and we used to have like a health and safety moment at the beginning of every meeting. Why can't we have a DNI moment at the beginning of every meeting where we talk about something, everyone in the room gets up and shares something. So being custodians of fairness, activating unexpected influences that's all around not being exclusive and saying like you know we're going to market people who are part of like an lgbtq plus group for example it's about getting everyone in the organization you know influencing and making that voice and activating those people in the business moving from comms to conversations is like actually having a dialogue right and ta leading that um, it's not just, you know, this is what we do or this is how we do something. or It's not just sending out a training manual. It's, it's having a continual, you know, platform for communication and then making it measurable, obviously, is using the data. Yeah. So. And, and, and something to, to bring all this together, Simon, as well, is when you were touching on the accountability piece earlier, right, and, and I think it's come up a, a few times, is not many orgs have a really... Um, I guess 360 DNI strategy. There'll be pockets of it. There might be, I don't know, the, the head of engineering is doing something in the, the software development space, but it's not being reflected in our consultancy practice or, or whatever. In your opinion, or from, from the companies you've spoken to, who should be accountable uh, for, for improving DNI, and and how can the TA function, um, you know, have a have a big impact? Not just by doing some of this stuff, but you know, trying to trying to build that accountability. Yeah, that's a great question. And like the simple answer is the accountability is everywhere, right? Like, I, I, think, I don't think anyone would argue with that. Like, it, you know, it's, it's got to be top to bottom, left to right, the whole organization, maybe even out both ends of the organization. And like, um, and it's, and it's about, it's a responsibility, like, you know, culture isn't made overnight. It's, it's about, you know, that whole thing about bringing yourself to work, being having communications, speaking out, if you see something that isn't right, talking about it, doing all of those things, and then generally via osmosis, the culture will change, and then everyone, you know, will be part of that, having that accountability. Um, in response to the talent acquisition piece, I think, like, it, it's this custodians of fairness bit for me. It's, it's TA, they, for, increasingly for internal recruitment as well as external recruitment, their role is to move talent into and around the organization and retain them. So if they are, they need to be, pushing the conversation 
and initiating and starting and continuing the conversation in an internal and external markets. Um, and the TA, the TA, every TA leader, every head of talent acquisition should have that as one of their key, you know, strategic enablers to achieving the outcomes the business wants, whether it's cost, speed, quality, and they should be, they should be kind of mandating on everyone in their team and every supplier that they use, whether that's recruitment agencies, tech platforms, that they follow those same and advocate those same sort of like DNI views. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that last point is something that, um, that we're really passionate about, right, is we, we want, uh, there's no point in all spending all of this time creating the perfect DNI strategy to then not pass that down the supply chain. And actually, you know, the partners that they go out and work with to say, you know, actually, we're going to hold you to these accounts and we're going to hold you to this standard, whether that be, you know, in our world, equal shortlists and, you know, making sure that whatever representation you're trying to achieve in that shortlist is there. Um, uh, and areas like that, I, I think, is, is super interesting. Um, I want to jump into some questions. Um, there were some that were submitted beforehand. Um, and we'll jump into any live in the Q&A. So yeah, if you want to jump in and ask any questions, use the Q&A feature and we'll see them. Uh, if we don't answer them, it's because they're in chat and uh, Simon and I will do that offline and we'll follow up in the, the, the follow-up email. Um, so let's, um, let's jump into some of these. So, um, okay, this is a oh, tough one, Simon. I'm sorry, I didn't want to put you on the spot like this. Is positive discrimination a good idea? Uh -huh. uh, you're right, that is a tough one. Um, Firstly, it's to do with legislation. So not, you can't positively discriminate in every single market. Mm -hmm. And then it's also to do with sector, private versus public sector. You can positively discriminate in some areas of the public, public sector. So I think there's not a yes or no answer to is positive discrimination a good idea. My heart tells me that everything that we've talked about today, if we get that right in creating a culture of, um, culture of inclusion, then we can bring all different types of diverse talent into the workplace and that will be inherent in the organization as opposed to needing to positively discriminate. But there are some markets, some sectors, some industries, some trades where positive discrimination is allowed. And yeah, why not? If that pushes the needle, if that gets more, you know, people from, a, you know, ethnic, different ethnicities or different genders into, into the workplace. Great. Right. Yeah. I think that's always been my take on this. It's interesting. Uh, I'm a big sport fan. So in the NFL, they've got the Rooney rule where um, every, uh, I think it's general manager, I'm not, completely up to date with the US sports structure. I mean, every GM has to, they have to have, uh, I believe it's a BAME representative in the interview panel. And I think they're looking at doing it for football managers in the UK because of the 98, 97 now, uh, sad for Bowie, uh, football clubs in, in the UK, I think there's only three uh, black managers, you know, which is, which is shocking. Um, but I agree, right? If, if we do everything else and hopefully we don't need to, but if it does push the needle and it's legal, why not? You know, why, why not? If, it, if it's a measure that's going to improve DNI um, and and get underrepresented groups into employment, let's do it. Yeah, and I think if you're an organisation that isn't diverse, then you might need that to start yeah, bringing it. Yeah, as long as you've got the culture that then retains and engages that talent. Absolutely. So, it's, you know, getting back yeah, you can't do, and that's it, right? There's no single, there's no silver bullet to this strategy. You can't go, okay, brilliant, we're going to go 50 50 shortlists and we're going to make sure we're going to go 50 50 hires, let's just say. But if you don't then have the inclusive culture, you're not going to retain anyone. You know, in six months, they will be out the door and you'll, you'll have to go again. Um, let's jump into another one. Um, given the benefits of diversity in the workplace, why do you think some organizations are slow to act and implement change? Uh, yeah, good question. So we're going, most industries, most companies are going through a time of unprecedented change. Mm -hmm. Business models, technology, you know, digital transformation. So you know, and also under severe cost pressures. So it's a difficult time for organizations where they're very busy. They've got quite a lot of change fatigue as well, especially if you look at technology transformation, like there's lots of stuff going on. There's the skills transformation. So you put all, you know, we talked for ages about this, putting all of that together, you know, it comes back to where are the C-suite going to prioritize DNI against a list of all the other things. So, I, you know, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a challenge, right? I think, it, it, you know, and it was interesting that um, only, I think, I think around half of, of the companies um, you interviewed or, or IBM interviewed actually had DNI targets and, and was like a top-down mandate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think it's right, right? There's, there's tons of things happening and probably a lot of orgs are worried about their survival, mm -hmm. you know, and actually, you know, having a business in 10 years and it's, DNI will have a positive impact, but some people don't see that uh, and, and they might not uh, be at that point. Um, I think we've probably got time for one or two more questions. Um, 
what's the the one piece of actionable advice you would give that say a, a head of resourcing or a, a head of talent acquisition to to get kick started on a journey of dni what one, one do you want just one or, 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 or a handful <laughs> a handful um one get sponsorship okay top level sponsorship okay um because i think without that you're gonna it's gonna be very hard to drive change in an organization um two educate and bring your whole team your whole resourcing ta function on that journey so they're becoming you know custodians of equality and fairness there's probably a three four five six seven <laughs> yeah no brilliant um i think uh dan gallagher has posted in a question now um the companies you interviewed were they enterprise size or sme i think we touched on this earlier i think you said sort of cross vertical more mid-market to enterprise yeah they were typically ibm clients customers so they were mid to large to enterprise size um, but I think a lot of what we've talked about today, Dan, um, can be related to like, you know, small organizations, startups, anything, um, as well. But no, I entirely agree. And actually, you know, whilst, um, large enterprises, you know, a core of our customer base, um, we do see, uh, a lot more sort of, um, startups and, and SMEs adopting almost like a DNI first strategy. Like, you know, Monzo would be a brilliant example of a, of a company that's exploded over the last couple of years. And I think they've done something really interesting where they hold themselves account publicly once a quarter where they post their latest um, DNI stats. And it sounds, you know, I, we don't work for Monzo, but from the outside looking in, it, it, it looks like they um, have taken the approach of a DNI first. Like when we actually found this organization, it's going to be built on a DNI culture, and, a, and I think we'll see more of the internet startups doing that. Yeah, and I think the smaller you are, the easier it is to be agile and to impact change. So there's less excuse. And it, as as we've said in this you know session, it's not all about the budget. It's important, but yeah, for sure. Um, great stuff. Cheers, Dan. Um, I think we've got uh, a couple of minutes left. So uh, any more questions, get them in now. Um, if not, I'll refer back to some of the ones that are posted in. Um, before, let's see if we can end on a, on a killer way. Uh, okay, interesting. Creativity. Um, what are some of the most creative ways you've seen uh, to uh, proactively source candidates, to retain candidates? Um, you know, I'm sure we can all talk through um, some of the more, uh, you know, industry standard stuff now. But yeah, what, what are some of the creative things you've seen done? So for me, it's all about offline and meeting in person. Okay. And like, that's controversial because like all of the rhetoric that we hear today is around tech, right? And don't get me wrong, there's a huge place for tech. There's a huge place for like digital marketing and recruitment strategies. But I think where we can really impact and where TA teams haven't invested as much in recently because of this trend is having offline events, you know, linking that to the business resource groups that we talked about um, and effectively building talent communities in person, as opposed to like maybe in a CRM or a TRM platform. I think you need both actually to be successful, but yeah. So that's probably, yeah. yeah. Like the, uh, you know, this other thing, the neurodiverse program that we looked at, and that's all about creativity. That's all about having more creative thinking and innovation and project teams through having different, you know, neurotypical and you know neurodiverse ways of thinking yeah um so that's a cool one as well yeah for sure um brilliant so i think oh uh karen i can two sets karen i can see that you've asked a question uh but i can't actually see it because <laughs> you know uh this is how these things work um so karen has asked how are other organizations tackling the conflict between creating a diverse state versus time to hire so i think we loosely touched this earlier but it's very interesting right a lot of orgs are being grilled on their time to hire and um uh how can we fill uh, seats as quickly as possible i think our research shows that it takes 58 days on average to find uh, a software engineer in the uk um and you know given that it's quite often uh, instrumental in some of the change programs time is always um challenging how you seeing people balance that yeah it's, it's a great question karen i think um there's no, there's no right or wrong answer. I, I, I'm personally not a huge advocate for like mandated diverse slates. I think there should be targets like a KPI, but not like, a, like an SLA, if you like. It just shouldn't be mandated because, as you say, we need to look at time. We need to look at speed to productivity. We need to look at cost. There's other metrics that are important to the business. And I think, again, we talked about having data and being able to report metrics back to the organization. And I think, actually, as recruitment organizations become more mature, and have data and analytics as part of their team. In, in, indeed, you know, you can't have a recruiter doing that. You need, you know, a data scientist type person in your recruitment team, interpreting that data, having the tools and then feeding back to the business. So we can start showing, you know, 
the importance and impact on you know different metrics um i don't know if that answers the question but hopefully it's and, and i think it's, it's something that we look at a lot is is the data and insights piece that we can provide our customers because uh, you know what the, the beautiful thing about data is quite often it just has the effect of holding a mirror up to an organization and showing like actually mm. this is the reality of what's going on you know everyone's got these preconceived ideas we've launched this initiative and it's having this impact and stuff but actually um if your time to hire is rubbish anyway right and it's taking you too long anyway well interesting you know what can you actually by tapping into a talent pool like a neurodiverse talent pool where 84 86 percent of you know degree qualified people um don't have a job um and we uh sorry for the background noise we have some building works going on downstairs and they did politely say uh that they won't do it for the hour of the webinar but they literally meant the hour to the minute so i think probably uh that is a good point to wrap up because nobody wants the sound of jewels in the background so uh thank you all for attending today um for those that didn't attend we'll share a video afterwards um we'll make sure we follow up with all of the research we've mentioned um in this webinar and just want to say a big thank you for simon for your time today pleasure cheers guys have a good rest of the week